I'm very pleased to welcome you all on, uh, on this uh, last uh, webinar of the Urban Salmon Working Group of 2021. Um, my name is Louise Taller. Uh, I am a salmon specialist working for Impact Initiatives and also co-chairing the Urban Salmon Working Group together with uh, Hilmi Mohamed and Tulio Mateo. Um, so it's a pleasure to, to run this working group um, together with the global um, shelter cluster guys. And we've had a fantastic two years together. Uh, but this is really a peak moment of the year for us to really gather our members and discuss uh, the practicalities of urban humanitarian action. So without further ado, I will start with a very quick um, introduction before we give the floor to our four uh, expert panelists uh, of the day. And thanks a lot again to them for making the time to, to present their experiences today. So very quickly, for a few who don't uh, know us that much or who are new to um, the Selman's approach uh, sphere, um, this is a quick uh, reminder of what this working group is about and also why you're most welcome to play a bigger part in, in what we're doing. So the Urban Salmon Working Group um, is a knowledge-based group um, that discusses how to uh, implement humanitarian interventions following or applying the salmon-based or area-based approach. And what is the area-based approach? It's uh, simply a way to deliver more effective outcomes uh, by looking at specific areas uh, geographic areas and by delivering projects that deliver on multiple outcomes across all sectors for the entire population in that specific area and also by collaborating more effectively with uh, with local lectures. So this is what we've been um, unpacking and promoting for the past three years. Um, and this is being done through uh, online webinars, so that's the reason why we're here today. Uh, advocacy to make sure that our donors are aware of the potential that comes with the summons approach and that they're ready to found it. Uh, we also do quite a bit of research. Um, we look for case studies that demonstrate the valuable obstacles of area-based approaches. And we also provide uh, technical advice to practitioners. So don't hesitate to liaise with us in case you're, uh, you know, in the midst of developing an area-based project. There are tons of expertise in this uh, large working group that you can benefit from. And lastly, we also do guidance production. So making sure that tools and guidance that's out there is available for you when you need it uh, in terms of, um, in terms of looking for ways to implement settlements and area-based programs. Um, so that's, uh, again, um, very briefly reminding what the settlements approach is. It's, we can never repeat it isn't enough. It's basically a way for aid agencies to deliver uh, on multiple sectors for the entire population and partner with local actors in a specific geographic area. So if there's only one thing that you should, uh, you want to know about the summons approach is that it has, it works uh, around four core components. The first component is the geographic component. Where are we doing it? The second is working multi-sectoral. So you really want to have programs that uh, deliver on all key priority sectors in that area. And then it also considers the entire population. So not just um, migrants, not just refugees or ADPs, but really trying to deliver positive outcomes for all vulnerable population groups living in that area. And lastly, it's also a way to empower local actors. So working with civil society uh, organizations, obviously with local governments, um, but also bringing on board development actors and the private sector uh, when they have value added to bring to, um, to programming and when they can respond to needs that humanitarian actors are heal equipped to, to look into. So that is in a nutshell what we're going to be discussing today. Um, we've, we did publish uh, a guidance note last year 
that really impacts how this works um, in practice and also sets uh, the, the, the core principles. Uh, and this year, we've really wanted to give the floor to practitioners to demonstrate and show with concrete examples how the settlements approach works in practice. So we've been hosting uh, approximately one webinar uh, per quarter, and we're welcome practitioners and experts uh, from field operations. And we're hoping that it's not only a way to give other practitioners insightful ideas about what they could do uh, in their own context, but also an opportunity for network creation. So don't hesitate to reach out amongst yourselves uh, to build new uh, meaningful programs um, in your areas of, of operation. So today's webinar is really going to be looking at the topic of collaboration. Um, the objective is to share evidence from very diverse crisis context where aid actors have invested a lot in, in collaboration. Collaboration with local stakeholders, with local businesses and the private sector, uh, with city authorities and uh, municipal leadership, of course, but also across clusters, uh, across cluster clusters working on, on different sectors in the same area. All of this uh, is meant to improve the outcomes of aid programs um, for every population group in the same target area. So today, the question uh, I'd like to ask our panelists is how, from their experience, individual aid organizations can partner effectively with other non-humanitarian stakeholders um, or for, with other stakeholders working in totally different sectors and what are the benefits of, of doing so? So to discuss that, we'll have four high-level panelists um, who will take the floor, or take the mic in a minute. First, we'll welcome Marco Rotuno and Petra Petranova. Both of them are working in Yemen. Uh, Marco is uh, for CCCM cluster and Petra is from the Danish Refugee Council. And they'll tell us about their area-based coordination project. Then we'll welcome Olivia Nielsen. She's a um, principal associate at Miyamoto International. And she will tell us how to partner with the private sector uh, to strengthen community resilience to risks and disasters. And lastly, we'll have Orlan Jado working for Agora in Burkina Faso. And she will tell us how her program links a humanitarian planning to municipal planning in a displacement affected city in uh, Eastern Burkina Faso. So without further ado, uh, let me welcome Petra and uh, Marco for their presentation. And please um, don't hesitate to share your screen. I'm sure it will be easier for you to run through the slides. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to share the screen right now. Hello, everyone. Again, this is Marco and Petra. Um, I actually was with the CCM cluster in Yemen until uh, last week, and I'm joining the global cluster next week. So I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm in the breach, basically, this week. But uh, we have been working with the, with the DRC, with the CCCM Strategic Advisory Group on, on this area-based approach paper that is almost ready. It has been endorsed by the, uh, by the SAG of the CCM cluster in Yemen. Um, so this is basically the test of the area-based approach paper. <laughs> and uh, we will we'll show it to you what, what was done until now, what are the achievements, challenges of, of an area-based uh, approach in, in a country like Yemen. Um, and we are talking together, like me and Petra, we said, let's have this uh, kind of radio <laughs> show, let's not do that <laughs> slide. So let's try. <laughs> um, so yes, uh, let, let's give you a bit of background. Um, yes, exactly. So um, to give you a little bit of a background, how and why did this uh, approach emerged and why the CCCM is taking uh, 
uh, this this model uh, and is attempting to formalize it. Uh, as you Louis mentioned, in line with the area-based and settlement-based approaches, also our scenario builds actually on CCCN's expertise in multi-sectoral coordination, but also community engagement uh, and engagement with the different stakeholders across displacement sites in order to deliver inclusive, localized, holistic, and multi-sectoral um, response. So in Yemen specifically, what are we looking at? We are looking at more than 2,000, well, almost 2,000 unplanned sites, diverse in its size, different in typologies, very scattered across different areas, in some cases merged with the host communities, uh, overall 1.3 million displaced Yemenis uh, across all of the country. In addition to this, what we face is that more, uh, more than half of those sites do not have any humanitarian actors uh, providing either coordination or assistance. So uh, it's a very unique scenario in which very traditional centralized coordination system uh, results in a very detachment response from the operational areas. Why? Because of a large number of uncovered sites, multi-sectoral needs, which are very severe, but also combined combination of access restraints. So thank you, Marco. I think it was you, Marco. Thank you for changing the slide. So if we are looking at the system and That's we not have me. the, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not uh, it's okay. So if we, if we have a sub the national coordination, for example, for CCCM based, let's say, um, let's say in Aden, uh, with the access restrictions and severity of displacement, uh, the coordination from the centralized system, it's very detached, let's say, from the West Coast, uh, which will be our case study, which we'll present to you. So West Coast, uh, we will be referring to, uh, to this area of four uh, districts in the southwest of Yemen. Uh, the role of the area-based coordinator has been, um, has been formalized by the cluster, but uh, as DRC, we can provide more of the operational expertise and experience from three different areas where this model has been uh, taking a very uh, different shapes and forms. And Marco, don't hesitate to, uh, to jump in. Uh, designating a specific area-based coordinator for a specific geographical area also allows for our NGOs and NGO agencies to be also presented uh, and advocating for the local needs and communities based on the on the ground expertise. So it's a mitigation system for the lack of access. It's also a mitigation system to take over some of the pressure on the main coordination hubs as well. And it also provides an opportunity to localize the response as well. Um, so the way how we would see this taking form and uh, how it has been taking for so far in the West Coast is that we have the area-based coordinator who is basically responsible for the area, which is smaller than a coordination hub, but larger than a single site. And uh, this role should provide the linkage with the, with, with the partners on the ground, but also authorities. Uh, and it, the area-based coordinator should have a direct link uh, to OCHA and other subnational clusters. So I'll jump in more into it specific uh, demonstration of how this system emerged and uh, how we can see it being operational under certain circumstances. For example, in the West Coast, uh, the current situation is that we are facing uh, uh, more than 100 of uh, displacement sites, uh, proportion of them are uncovered. Um, some of them, uh, are, they are very different in sizes and also in, uh, in terms of geographical spread. They also, some of them are, dis, are scattered within the host communities. So sometimes the boundaries between IDP and host communities are not necessarily clear. So those are just some of our sites where we have been intervening. So as you can see, separating and only dedicating the site level multi-sectoral coordination might prevent from a holistic geographical approach, but also it might limit some of the linkages with all the surrounding communities which uh, are present within the area. So how did it take shape and form like that? Uh, back in 2019, or even earlier in 2018, 
if we go way back, there were only few agencies on the ground in, uh, in the West Coast. Um, the majority of activities were very short-term intervention, leaving only a very small number of actors uh, with a very static uh, engagement and presence. Um, also, the access uh, and regular access of UN agencies, for example, was uh, restricted, um, which remains to an extent the same in some of the areas across Yemen. Um, there was also a limited, the, all of this resulted with a limited formal engagement between authorities and multiple actors and uh, stakeholders. Uh, so the ERC was a system actor present in the area and uh, at the time managing three uh, large displacement settlements, we were basically the CCCM actor physically present on the ground. Um, as there was a very limited number of other uh, service providers, um, the coordination for a specific multi-sectoral intervention across the site uh, was, um, it resulted in coordination with the, with the same stakeholders all the time. In addition, as the crisis progressed, a new displacement uh, appeared next to existing displacement sites. Um, so we had, a, we, we, we had a diversity in terms of uh, which sites are being served, uh, what kind of services are, how we basically are prioritizing services across different displacement sites. Um, when the cluster formalized and initiated and designated DRC as an area-based coordinator for the West Coast in 2019, we have officially moved beyond site level coordination uh, to the geographical monitoring, mapping, and coordination of services by different um, stakeholders. So already the first meeting uh, brought basically everyone together, uh, just start from the beginning, from the side-led mapping, monitoring of what do we have, where do we have it, what services are being delivered, what resources everybody has, and how we can prioritize uh, across different um, uh, displacement sites. A uh, coordination platform was also attended and still is attended by, by local authorities such as uh, Water Ministry, um, Ministry of Education, and basically bringing those linkages into place to also seek the opportunities for, uh, for engagement uh, and also more and capacity building of, of different stakeholders as well. So in addition to this, uh, we, sh we have to, and the system itself, acknowledging the needs of surrounding population as well. Um, how, for instance, the WASH intervention. WASH intervention in general should be a comprehensive intervention which considers uh, and acknowledges also the pressure on their existing resources which are caused by the displacement and have a negative impact on the host community. So having a holistic wash intervention would mean to, it, to prioritize rehabilitation of system which benefit both host community and IDPs as well. Education system or health gaps, those can be bring the broad uh, in a more holistic manner, also linking the ministries, IDPs and host communities to advocate, let's say, for the inclusion of students from the sites in um, in schools available outside of the sites, and also to, to raise issues higher uh, in terms of gaps, which often are faced by both host community and IDP. Lack of health provision is often affecting both uh, in an equal manner. Um, in terms of uh, additional, in terms of additional linkages and opportunities, for instance, uh, advocacy for durable solutions, which has been um, taken up by our uh, area-based uh, coordination, uh, has been uh, quite the key in in order to identify more of a long-term uh, solution not only to displacement, but again to the geographical area. Uh, where we intervene. Um, in terms of majority of needs, which I have flagged, so as, as I mentioned, we have a major uh, number of sites which are not covered, and having a area-based coordinator there can also mobilize the resources uh, 
uh, let's say there is a fire at some of the sites which are not managed by anyone, this is where this role would come in and uh, would be able to facil facilitate and mobilize the response of different stakeholders. So it's um, especially in settings which we are facing here, uh, it has been highly applicable. So in the West Coast, we have got Hartridge area, operational restrictions, scheduled displacement. It was inevitable to move beyond the side level coordination. It falls into the system in a way that uh, operational, um, operational uh, coordination should be still and is still being managed by the area-based coordinator, while high level issue can be escalated through the existing system uh, to OCHA. Uh, and uh, this also allows another layer of uh, an opportunity of, uh, of uh, engagement. Uh, so area-based coding model, we do believe it has, and Marco, I know that you've been a very strong supporter of, um, of seeking the linkages and how it fits into overall coordination system. Uh, it does provide an opportunity to strengthen the linkages between IDPs and host communities, but also it gives voice to uh, local actors, uh, some partners who on the ground need further capacity building in terms of not only CCCM, but coordination mechanism itself. Um, and also it allows us to have a more systematic, holistic and comprehensive um, coordination model. Um, Marco, <laughs> sorry, I might have <laughs> taken too much time. Um, I think. And uh, as, um, I think the time is almost uh, over for for the presentation. Yeah, but also, I, I was about to ask you to be very brief, Marco. If you're you're very welcome to give uh, closing remarks, just make sure you're brief because we want to have enough time to hear Olivia and Orlan. Uh, and their yeah. case studies. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and also I saw a lot of uh, questions from the chat. So maybe after uh, we finish, maybe me and Petra can uh, reply to, to all of them. I just replied to one because then I, I, I was following Petra's uh, uh, slides. So maybe we can write them on the, um, on the chat. Uh, yeah. No, just remark as, as uh, Petra mentioned, it's a very uh, context-based and Yemen uh, look like the perfect context where to uh, experiment this, um, despite some challenges in uh, uh, explaining why this is better than a centralized uh, kind of approach um, and why the other actors should be should be involved. Which is first of all um, the other uh, the other clusters, for instance, is difficult when the structure is. Is not the same as as uh, as for instance CCM cluster. Then it's difficult to find the right interlocutor. So the key is really to find uh, the key interlocutors for other clusters from OCHA. So how can we report it? Uh, it's very operational, so it requires many many uh, operational uh, steps to be to be taken, um, and of course. Actually, the involvement of uh, local actors, that was one, on, one of the questions, was like the local level. So it's very, very similar how the local level works with the, basically with the area-based approach. So it was easy to, to step in in a structure that at, at uh, authorities, local authorities level, was already working like that. And actually it eases up uh, the process a lot. So now our, our next steps are to, um, to coordinate these with the, with the clusters. And we have many cases. I wrote we have uh, 13 now, 13 area-based coordinators all over the, the country, but more uh, area-based coordinators are needed. So we are, we are trying to involve the other, uh, the other clusters and the other actors in the different areas where this is not happening yet. So it's a working process. Uh, the case study, I hope soon, because it was endorsed by ISAC, so in the next week or couple of weeks. And we can share this presentation. And um, the case study will be for sure available in the CCCM operational data portal. I'll put the link here, so you'll find it very soon there. Petra, did I forget anything? 
and we can maybe work on the replies on, on the chat. I don't hear Petra, so we can... No, thank you. Yeah, I've, I'm going to catch up uh, and uh, respond to Iran. Thank you, Marco. Thank you. So we remain available for any other questions here. Thanks. Okay, is it my turn? Should I just go ahead? Tell me your Luis. Uh, yes, yes, go ahead, Olivia. Uh, we had a mission with Luis uh, who was dropped on the system. So um, go ahead, please. Okay, let me see. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, yes, perfect. We can see it. Uh, Olivia, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so I'm Olivia Nielsen. I work for Miyamoto International. We're a people-centered engineering firm that focuses on disaster risk reduction. Um, so, you know, the topic of my presentation today will be how we collaborate across sectors, especially with the private sector, to either prevent disasters before they happen or support the recovery after a disaster. Um, and the, the reason why we work so closely with the private sector is because working with the private sector can really, really do a lot in preventing disasters, but also can make the recovery much, much faster after disaster happens. And to give you an idea, you know, in, in some circumstances, uh, two out of three businesses do not recover from a disaster and have to close. And if you think about the impact on employment and on the economy, it makes the recovery process much, much longer. There's lost livelihoods, there's supply, ch supply chain disruptions, it makes reconstruction harder, um, and the economy suffers in the long run. So working with disasters or with uh, private businesses before the disaster happens makes a lot of sense. Um, so I'll give you a few examples of how we do this. Uh, the first one is a program we have with USAID in Indonesia. It's a four-step program, and we try to incorporate the ideas behind the settlements approach in working with these businesses. And the first step is we enter, we choose a community, we choose a settlement, and we do a, you know, a holistic risk diagnosis of the settlement. Then we pick some select businesses to work with. We can't work with every business, but we can work with a range of businesses, large and small, and help them develop a business resilience plan. Then we do some disaster scenario planning to say, okay, in the case of a disaster, how are you gonna respond? Um, and then we engage the entire private sector in this DRM process. But what does this mean in practice? So here is an example of um, some businesses that we are working with in Indonesia. And there some of them are quite small. They can be a mom and pop shop. Uh, they can be a landlord with you know, six apartments or they can be a bank, a global or a national bank with branches in the settlements. So working with a variety of businesses is very important because we're setting in place the templates that can be replicated across these different businesses. And the concept we've tried to develop is that the business is not a standalone entity. It is a core part of the community. It is a core part of the settlement. The business depends on the settlement for labor, for materials, for customers, but the settlement also depends on the business for the provision of goods and services, for the provision of employment, et cetera, et cetera. So it's all very much intertwined and we need to understand these interconnections between the businesses and between the community. And for, to give you an example, I'm a housing expert, and like, um, if the houses collapse during a disaster, then the businesses will be hurt because their employees will have nowhere to live, and they're not going to go to work if they have nowhere to live. And vice versa, if the business collapses during a disaster, or if it's flooded, then the employees will have nowhere to work, and they will lose the income that supports their rental housing. So everything is very much intertwined, and helping the business frame their connection to the settlement across multiple angles is really, really helpful to understand the linkages there. So once we have done this, we help them develop what we call a, a, a resilience action plan. 
Um, and, and this is like really what you need to do to, you know, before disaster happens and after the disaster itself. Moving on to another program across the world in Latin America. This is another program with USAID. Um, and we are implementing this one called Prepare in I think eight different countries at the moment in Latin America. And this one is a bit more complex. We are working with numerous actors in different communities um, before the disaster happens. And here we are working at the municipal level, but not only with the municipalities, but with the businesses within the, muni within the municipalities too. And this model focuses a lot more on data collection. We want to get as much data as possible to create a probabilistic risk assessment. And we train people, we train and we train to prepare you know, for the disaster. Um, and here's an example in Trinidad and Tobago, one of the eight countries in which we are implementing this program. Some of the actors we are collaborating with might surprise you. Um, they include AmCham, which is the American Chamber of Commerce in Trinidad and Tobago, and has a number of different businesses that are part of it. And by working with this Chamber of Commerce, we are able to disseminate our um, methodology to a number of different businesses. And then these businesses, as a core backbone of the economy, can then implement these trainings at their level um, and support the prevention efforts at a much wider level. And then finally, this is a very different type of program one that we're doing with the World Bank IFC. And this is more on the recovery side of things. So we're developing a public-private partnership with the government and a private developer to support victims of the floods that happened in Timor last, I think it was in April of this year, where tens of thousands of households were left homeless. And the concept behind a public private partnership is that we take the strengths of the public sector and mix them with the strengths of the private sector and try to eliminate weaknesses in the process. Um, and so, for example, in Timor Leste, the government has a lot of land, but doesn't have a lot of resources to invest in housing. Whereas the private sector and a, and a, and a housing site of the size can cost up to $300 million to build, can put down that money, borrow from a bank, leverage equity, leverage debt, and put that money into this project. So we're really trying to minimize risks and leverage the um, attributes of both parties. So there's a lot of stakeholder engagement in the process. It is not simple to do a housing development of this size. We're talking about around 2,000 units. We have to work with different ministries. We have to work with the municipalities. We have to think about water and electricity. Um, we have to work with banks and developers and insurance companies <laughs> and construction companies. It's quite the, quite the, the partnership. Um, but at the end of the day, we're really hoping that it creates a model for a mixed income community where maybe you know, one third of the community can really go to, to victims of these terrible floods that happened in April. Another third can go to higher income individuals and then that can cross subsidize um, the, the, the very lower income individuals that we're trying to support. And that this type of project can actually be replicated without aid because all you need here is the government and a private sector party. So thank you. I tried to be brief um, and give you some examples out of many, many more that we have that how the private sector is so, so key in both preventing the disasters and also you know, accelerating the recovery after disaster. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have on this. Thank you. Julia, you want to take on? Thanks a lot, Olivia. Um, I think it's great to see how, how the, the private sector can be implicated and how we as humanitarian organizations are, are active now uh, doing that. Um, I am not seeing questions on the chat for you yet. Um, so what we'll do to keep it going is we'll hand it over to Orlan and we will have, uh, we invite you to post your questions on the chat. 
so we can answer them either through the chat or at the end. Orlan? Yeah, let me share the screen. Uh, can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Okay. So thank you everyone. Uh, I'm Orlan and I work for the NGO Impact Initiatives and I'm based in Ouagadougou in Burkina Faso. Uh, Sorry, Arlan. Impact yeah. We are seeing, we're not seeing it full screen. We are seeing the, uh, now we're seeing it full screen. Yes. Right. Okay. Now it's good? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, Impact Initiative is an organization which aims to improve the impact of humanitarian stabilization and development actions through data partnership and capacity building program. Uh, due to the topic of the webinar today, I will present one of the impact initiatives, which is the Agora initiative. And as we implemented it here in Burkina. Uh, Agora initiative is a joint initiative between two NGOs, which are ACTED and impact initiatives. Uh, ACTED is responsible for the operational part of the project and impact for the research part. And these initiatives aim to support the process of organization short-term humanitarian action while supporting the planning and implementation of recovery and development action with a long-term objective. So to start, uh, I will give you a little bit of background on the context of displacement uh, situation here in Burkina Faso. Um, so um, uh, we are in the uh, central Sahara region. And so since the 2012 crisis in Mali, uh, the crisis spread in Niger and Burkina Faso. And the area of tension is now called the three border uh, area. In Burkina Faso, it's a recent crisis with a quick deterioration of the situation since 2019. And uh, there is a volatility of security context with a persistent deterioration since January 2021, with intensification of ultimatums attacks targeting civilian, civilians, not only military force. Um, and uh, there is an anticipated intensification of attacks in the east region with displacement of insecurity from the Sum, the north, Malian border toward east. Uh, so there is a continuum of uh, displacement. And um, a significant proportion of the displaced population has no intention of returning as uh, 37 of IDPs this year, according to the MSNA and entering this, uh, this um, survey. And they have no intention of returning to their locality, locality of origin, which is an important information for emergency response and long-term planning. And those IDP, um, IDPs, displacement, those displacements are mostly IDPs and there are more than 1.4 million uh, uh, nowadays. Uh, to briefly present you the type, type, um, type typology in Burkina Faso. Uh, this population movement has to lead to the emergence of massive settlement of IDPs in urban centers and on the direct outbreak of post cities, particularly, particularly on spontaneous sites or among the non-displaced non communities living there. Uh, this phenomenon has resulted in a significant and rapid demographic increase in several cities in Burkina Faso. Um, for example, uh, the city I'm going to present you uh, right after, which is the city where we are implementing the project, the project uh, reported approximately 46,000 IDPs uh, in June in the commune of uh, Fada and Goma. Uh, and the typology of the site and the organization of the hosting of IDPs may differ depending on the city from in-camp or camp-like setting to out-of-camp. To illustrate that, um, you can see uh, we the type, typology of the sites. You can see here a cartographic representation of the urban expansion of the city of Pada between February 2018, so before the crisis, and February 2021. Um, and in Pada, there are no form of um, people are in the host communities or uh, renting houses or um, are, are settled in uh, in shelters. Um, on one side, we can see a new part of the city that seemed to have emerged since uh, 19, 2009, 
2019 in the southern east of the city that you can see in light and dark purple. And on the other side, through the purple coloring uh, mixed with yellow, we can observe a densification in the heart of the city itself. It may suggest that some IDPs have been integrated into the natural uh, urban growth uh, of the town, particularly those uh, have built new houses in material, in material similar to those of non-displaced people. And those IDPs are more difficult to identify. They are not the most vulnerable, uh, as they often have access to sustainable shelter and are integrated in local communities, but their settlements can have a significant impact on the service provision in the area. In addition, um, you can see in red, uh, as part uh, as the part frame in red, correspond to administrative sector, which means that those parts are uh, which we call uh, settled, like a recognized flood division and connected to water, sanitation, etc. So a big part of the city is outside outside of the administrative sectors. Okay, uh, why we use an area-based approach for this project? Uh, the, the, aim of, the aim of Agora project in Burkina Faso is to support the local institution in the area affected by the displacement situation in the planning and coordination of all recovery initiatives. And it also aims to support humanitarian action in identifying relevant interventions that can be directly implemented within the framework of the project. So humanitarian crises have cumulated effects on uh, diverse population groups, host community, internal displaced people, governance actors, private sectors, on territories that were vulnerable before this the crisis, with urbanization, with displacement to urban centers, with territories that were already at risk of natural disaster or like flood, and uh, sectors that were independent, like a lack of access to water can impact livelihood, health, social cohesion, etc. So humanitarians are committed to provide a holistic multi-sectoral assistance in the most affected areas. And there is this, therefore, an idea to link the emergency and development to collaborate with local actors to strengthen their capacity and mainly the municipalities, which have an important role in strengthening existing service. And the territorial approach responds to this challenge. So here are um, the Agora objectives. Um, there are four pillars we called, uh, four objectives. Um, so um, Agora is implemented through an ABA approach by an assessment of the need of the territories and the affected population in parallel through a consultation in, and participation of relevant actors in the consultation of a response that will be finalized in the recovery plan. So this is a black objective to provide a, a recovery plan, plan uh, fitting with assessment of needs and through a participative consultation. And the goal for each act is for each actor to take the ownership of the plan and implement the response activities defined jointly with local actors, authorities, and population. This is the gray uh, objective. And the two other objectives in red and beige are to work closely with uh, local actors and, for example, uh, with the logistical and financial support for municipal NGOs, local stakeholders for coordination meetings. And in beige, to strengthen the seeking on, and consultation capacity of municipal team with uh, local leaders that are uh, with training and uh, technical assistance for municipalities and technical services. Uh, in further now, this, the project here is, is a pilot, so we are implementing only two objectives, uh, the development of a plan and the implementation of a direct intervention. It's possible that this type of project will be implemented again in the region in the future and include the two other objectives, uh, which are in the middle. So the methodology we used to, um, for this project is um, that within the framework of the territorial assessment of urban diagnoses, a mixed methodology combining mapping, quantitative, and qualitative survey was used. This process is part of a participatory approach in conjunction with local institutions and community living in the study area. This mixed methodology approach aims to provide an accurate as possible overview of the situation of ITPs and non-displaced communities living 
in the study of area in terms of access to basic social community infrastructure and services um, and community protection, social cohesion, and more specifically of their condition and priority needs. And the second part of the methodology is uh, the participatory planning. Um, with, uh, we organized two workshops uh, in a row. A first uh, two-day community consultation was held to present the results of the urban diagnosis, diagnosis to the population. It was an oppor opportunity to get their feedback on the results of the assessment and a school facilitation exercise to identify the main causes of the needs and the barrier to access to social community service. Finally, through a participatory planning process, we were able to outline possible solutions to the needs. And the second phase was the consultation with local actors, which were uh, local authorities, high commission, technical services, municipalities, and aid actors. Um, and the aim to uh, plan a multi-sectoral operational response plan based on the community consultation and the evaluation results. As of today, we are in the sectoral enrichment phase, which aim to consol consolidate the response strategy defined during the two workshops with uh, sectoral experts. The final objective is the elaboration of a joint and participatory report plan with local actors and community. Um, so to support this process of organizing short-term uh, humanitarian action, action while supporting the planning and implementation of recovery and development action with the long-term objectives, information needs are diverse. Uh, they, they include the identification of area of concentration of IDPs, uh, the community territorial dynamics, uh, the most serious needs and vulnerabilities among the displaced and non-displaced population. Um, it uh, includes also to diagnose the dynamics of coexistence and integration into local governance and to identify barriers to access and uh, service delivery. So the collaboration with the communities and local actors and local uh, institutions are uh, at the heart of the project. The observation being, um, due to the security context, a uh, displaced population has settled in cities. And this population has humanitarian needs, which are partly taken care of by uh, humanitarian actors. At the same time, this displacement situation affects cities. The territories were impact and the service were overlaid. Uh, the functioning of this service is the responsibility of the local authorities. And they have mostly all of the cities reference documents often, uh, that often govern the operation and also have long-term development plan. In FADA, for example, the local authorities have a long-term local planning for all sectors, but this reference document uh, is predate displacement situation and has expired. So there is a possibility of complementarity of action and the objective of the project and of the plan is to, um, is to, is to plan with local institutions, ed actors, civil societies, service provider and the community and actions to meet today's urgent need while including tomorrow objectives. Um, Okay, you can see here two pictures of the participatory planning workshop uh, with communities and local actors that were held in October. Um, the entire project of AGOA is designed to build on the existence to avoid duplication and promote synergy. Uh, in, any, in addition to presenting the results of uh, assessment, the planning process includes- uh, Colin, uh, ju just to, uh, sorry to cut you off, but uh, if you yeah. can wrap up in about a minute, thank you. Yeah. Okay, okay. So I can just present you here a um, preliminary, preliminary result of uh, uh, planning the response uh, for one sector, which is income generating activities. So here are the, uh, the plan as it may look after, um, after the consultation with uh, experts. Uh, these are the priorities defined by the community and local authorities and different type of uh, activities possible in Beige. Um, <clears throat> uh, one quick lesson learned, uh, a positive one, is the uh, benefits of the consultation. Both communities and institution, institutional participants find it very valuable to be consult consulted and to be able to formulate ideas to brainstorm and to work together. And some last slide, um, some questioning and axis of consolidation we're uh, thinking is to, um, 
to maybe act now, uh, next time at the municipal level as the scale uh, is really important and they have parents, parents uh, geographical and administrative. Um, also, it's really important to uh, inform uh, and to adapt the answer with local uh, organization, local do uh, existence document um, and uh, and to seek the complementarity of action, as I may say before. And the last one is advocacy planning. Uh, this project so is uh, implemented by IMPACT, but in action taken care of by uh, any actors uh, that can implement the project. And we may include an advocacy planning phase to be sure uh, the, there will be an implementation of the plan. So thank you. Uh, if you have any any question, I may be glad to answer them. I think uh, our co-chairs both lost their internet. Uh, maybe they are back, but I will upgrade myself uh, to uh, facilitate it. Uh, Lu Luis, are you in uh, to Leo? Do you want to take on? If not, I can... Uh, Yes. Yeah, so I, yeah, you can do it. Uh, I, I'm from my phone. I had a series of blue screen, and I'm unable to to follow up so closely. No, but we want to thank the the presenters. Uh, thanks so much. I, I think there were some questions on the chat, and uh, one that I that I saw that was very interesting, especially for for Len, was how how were you dealing with um, a, how do you deal with uh, the trans, transient uh, uh, or transiting IDPs, no? I guess uh, that was your question, Hilmi. And um, I think you made reference to having the, the municipal government, but maybe you can explain better how, how you work with them. Orlan? Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so for the first question, actually, there are not that much uh, transient population uh, in Burkina Faso. Most people that settle in one area, uh, they stay there. So this is why a development, uh, include a development part in humanitarian response is really important that people has uh, for now the intention to stay in the local locality where they are, uh, because most of them have families or uh, or find uh, economic activities. Um, and um, for the second question, uh, we haven't met any conflict of pressure for different municipalities actor for now uh, on the on the on the assistance they may they may have. Uh, the the deal we have actually is more than is to inform them on what kind of uh, humanitarian response is there and. Uh, to be the more proactive as possible to inform them how we can and how we would like to implement the, the project and how it can be uh, to fit their needs and how you can answer their, their needs. That highlights the, the fact that we need to find ways to share that information with the, with the different, in this case, stakeholders, no? And, um, Maybe one of the other questions that I found very interesting was for Olivia uh, regarding um, how do you keep how do you keep uh, the private sector uh, motivated and engaged to give back to the to the communities? No, and uh, I mean I, I now I cannot see the whole question because I, I was dropped, but Olivia I probably saw it. Um, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that, please. Yeah. I mean, it starts by helping the private sector understand their interdependence with the community, right? Without the community, they wouldn't have employees, they wouldn't have customers, um, and, and vice versa, you know, the community needs a private sector. And so once they can really visualize that interdependence between both, their level of interest and engagement and, and desire to really prevent disasters and help in the recovery is, is accelerated. Mm. But that's something that it's built progressively, you know, that it's not that something that you build 
within uh, two or three months. It's something that you have to build in time, right? Yeah, exactly. It, take, it takes time and it takes exercises, um, but, but, but it works. I mean, they, they really do care. They really, mm -hmm. really do care. Because at the end of the day, they are themselves members of the community. They are, they are individuals who are members of their own communities, yeah. And was there any, any sort of uh, like incentive, separate incentive uh, put up by the, by the program uh, or, or by the government itself throughout the, the, this, throughout the intervention? No, <laughs> not really, okay. like a financial okay. incentive, no. I mean, the incentive, it kind of pays for itself by helping businesses prepare, they will do better when a disaster occurs. But they have to acknowledge that and see themselves into that. Exactly. And, and, the, and the truth is that big businesses already do this. You know, the, the, the global banks and, and the global corporations already have disaster mitigation plans. Businesses, they do not. Once they understand the, how critical this is, you know, it's it's it doesn't take much convincing, much convincing to go forward. Maybe now I'm thinking about the other context that we saw at the beginning from our colleagues in, in Yemen, no, and, and how maybe I don't know Marco or or Petra, if there was, if you have any thought on on that, uh, consider, all things considered in in your context about the engagement of, of private sector or maybe on the diaspora. You there, guys? Yes. Petra, let me know if you want to step in, but uh, it's it's very initial uh, phase, this one. Uh, we're just thinking on, on some of the early recovery slash durable solutions, but still we're not in the in the return phase, still we are not in the infrastructural work. So very, very small uh, projects that we have been looking at with uh, more of the development UN agencies, for instance. Um, civil society is really, I mean, there is a civil society, but activities and, and funds for the civil society and projects done by the civil society, very, very rare. Uh, so uh, we hope that that this this approach will help in the oper operationalization and and the involvement of of the uh, local the host communities etc. But it will it's still a very very bottom up kind of kind of idea and uh, very very uh, initial as I said. Petra, I don't know if you want to add anything on that. Petra is more hopeful on this uh, actually. <laughs> Uh, yes, well, uh, it, before, uh, of course, we are facing lots of, lots of challenges uh, with the system, but it, it's more for me the idea, an opportunity to rethink the, the way we do things. And uh, as, as you said, Marco, I fully agree. Uh, there is a definitely potential how this system would fit in linkages also with the private sector. Uh, and I think at one point it will be definitely inevitable. I think in general, what is quite surprising here is that uh, I feel we can definitely do much too and should do much more progress towards the uh, uh, engagement with the private sector, identification of the opportunities, how to engage, where to engage, uh, early recovery uh, and durable solutions. We are, we have lots of work to do to, um, to advocate. First thing first is the ceasefire needed. <laughs> yes. Because yes. Uh, then otherwise, like, okay, not like uh, movements yeah. of people, goods, humanitarian actors, even those are very, very limited now. So the rest is really not, an, not a thing yet. So we really hope it will come soon. I guess this is like a, a reminder for us to, to, you know, be able to do that uh, calling of uh, of uh, a private stakeholders into the conversation and and to be part of the of the change and I think it change it takes time uh, and definitely some contexts are more uh, enabler uh, have a more of an enabler factor than than others. Um, I think uh, we are at the hour, but we have uh, one last question here for Lan. If you face any uh, challenge or owing to security situation in Burkina Faso. 
I, I guess that is something that is not only applicable for Burkina, I think that would be also similar for colleagues from uh, Yemen. Um, but I don't know if Fernand, you have any anything else that you want to add on, on that and how that has affected your all of your work and analysis and maybe engagement of the same community before we close it up. Yeah. Um, so we're actually implementing this project only in one city uh, in Burkina Faso in the east region and uh, the city Falangoma. Like most of the cities are. Um, has a, a lower a security risk as in contrary of axes and like roads and uh, villages. Um, and so we, we had not so many challenge of access in the city as a part of the team of the team is based there. And so either for the evaluation or uh, participatory planning or meeting with local authorities and local actors, we didn't have any issues with, uh, with security. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, well, I guess we are now at the hour, right, Amy? Yes, um, we, are, we can get, a, if, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, email one of the co-chairs uh, and we will definitely get you answers. And also, if you uh, in future want to share, participate in this meeting present, uh, feel free to contact us. Thank you.